Hey guys, so today uh, we have a video that I've been playing for a while and people have been recommending it for a while and then I finally watched all the content about it and I realised how crazy the story is so I kind of want to talk about that. Subscribe to the bell icon for engagement, let's get into it. So today we're talking about Scentbird and not because I'm like sponsored by them, actually quite the opposite. I am probably never going to be sponsored by them. But there is just some funky stuff happening with the CEO of Scentbird. If you guys haven't seen it, you're in for a treat. If you have seen it, then just stick around and hang out with me and let's all just chat about it together. For transparency, Scentbird has reached out to me multiple times um, in the last maybe two years uh, to do a sponsorship with me. And every single time we get to the stage where I'm like, yeah, sure, let's do the sponsorship because I thought they were just like a regular perfume company. And then they're like, oh, do you live in the UK? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, oh, sorry, we can't work with you. It's like, how did you not check? And then it would happen again and again and again and again. And every time they reach out to me, I thought they maybe the rules change and they can finally work with people in the UK. And then they just don't. And it's like the same thing every time. So it got to a point where I was like, I don't really understand what's going on, but I guess it's just not destined for me to work with them. And that actually ended up being a blessing in disguise. Now, am I saying the people working with Scentbird are bad people? No, I am not saying that. Am I telling you guys to hound and bring the pitchforks out for anyone working with Scentbird in the past, present or future? No, don't do that in my name. Don't hound people. This is just a little funny haha that we're doing on this channel. And then let's keep it here. Uh, what people decide to do with this is their business, maybe because this is quite like a weird situation so I'm not really sure what the best course of action is I guess so I'm just trying to keep it very neutral, let people figure things out on their own and you guys let me know what you think, okay? So a lot of people think that the CEO of Scentbird is in a cult. Now, I'm conflicted on that and I guess we'll decide that by the end of the video I don't think I will, but I'm just waiting for the comments to roll in so that we can all kind of collectively decide what's going on because I'm confused. I just don't know if she's quite in a cult yet. Yet being the key word. Like, it's it's getting there. I just don't know if we're, like, quite there yet. 100%. If you guys don't know what Scentbird is, this is the Scentbird website. It's Scentbird New York. And essentially, it's a brand where you can go on a date with a perfume and you can basically try out a new perfume every single month without having to commit to a full bottle, which is great. I've been doing this thing because Scentbird's not in the UK and they don't want to work with me because I'm in the UK. I just do this thing where I buy travel sizes of everything or I'll buy little like sample sizes and they're such a scam because they cost so much more money per milliliter than just getting a full size. But I'd rather that then buy a perfume, use it one, two, three times, and then realize, oh, it gives me migraines. It's too sickly for me, it makes me feel sick. Like, I'm very sensitive to scents, so unless I've, like, tried it, I can't commit to a full bottle anymore because I have so many, like, 10% used bottles of perfume that I don't use anymore just because I bought a full size and I didn't love it. So I get this concept, and I just buy little travel sizes and little minis, but this essentially is a subscription service, and every single month you get to pick... I believe it's like four or five perfumes and they'll send you little vials and you put it in this like cute packaging which they have updated over the years which looks really chic and then you get to just use that perfume and I think it's like the perfect amount that you'll use up within a month or however like whenever the subscription renews and you can try your first month for $8.47 instead of $16.95 anyways that's what Scentbird is okay their reviews on Facebook actually aren't great so they have a Facebook page uh, which has 781 thousand followers and they have 1400 reviews with a 2.9 star rating um someone said worst experience ever kept charging me 90 dollars and can't get it to stop or get customer service they are liars and thieves beware of this company and their deceitful ways to get your money it's not worth to get such a headache at the end of the day you end up with a bunch of worthless things and without the possibility to stop it think before you jump on it cancelled a six month subscription a minute after accidentally subscribing they send me a random perfume and charge me for six months plus premium charge plus two random unknown charges the website provides no cancellation option and you have to contact support any company that follows this business practice will not earn my respect you are on my ban list i will not recommend this service i tried twice to order to get a subscription my account was flagged as fraud without any reason my account was locked and when i contacted customer service i was told that i was tagged as a fraudulent account without any reason they never did a video package i have had sent for over six years and i've been satisfied until i started having issues with since not being added to my queue so of course i reached out through anyway people are just not happy with this brand seems to be that the customer service isn't great let me actually so i also went on trustpilot and their reviews are 3.2 which is only like 0.3 higher than their facebook one and they have a lot of one stars not many two three four but then many five stars it kind of does go like that with reviews people only 
ever really give super negative or super positive and you don't really think about reviewing if it's like a three because what you're gonna say great like okay so the one stars are they charge man they charge you to cancel is some okay oh man they charge you to cancel is some real dirty work i subscribed got my first purchase and it was cool but the size made me realize that the price for the subscription wasn't worth it of course i canceled but without knowing they were going to charge me for a month with no cologne purchase the month previously just by local um perfect customer service bad commercial practices it's all about like they're refusing to cancel these subscriptions essentially okay so just be aware if you are planning on buying scentbird at any point after this it might not be the best thing in the world who knows one of the three founders of scentbird is called maria so this is the team so about scentbird scentbird is a fragrance subscription service with a mission with a mission is to empower hmm someone should have revised that with a mission to empower each and every person to express themselves through scent with a vibrant global community of fragrance aficionados and beginners storied fragrance houses and up-and-coming perfumers all brought together by our belief in the power of scent scentbird is your fragrance destination a single place to discover explore learn about and experience scents just for you now their founders are maria sergey and andre andre um and sergey and and maria are actually husband and wife and they're kind of in this little cult thing together okay now i'm playing cult because we don't actually know she's in a cult yet but we'll figure that out now Maria, there's an article about her in 2015 that I found how a Russian immigrant started the next major US beauty company. So at 18, Maria Nurisamova, Nusamova left her family and homeland behind to come to the US. Today she is the CEO of Scentbird, one of the most successful new startups in the beauty space. So this is a story about a precocious little girl named Masha. She grew up in a dilapidated industrial town called Bazinki right next to an infamous prison that housed some of the most dangerous criminals in Russia. Her father was a biology professor and was stationed by the government at the local university. Um, so growing up in Bazinki was tough. Um, the prisoners were released, they had nowhere to go and no money to support themselves. So they would obviously live in that town and it probably wasn't a great vibe. Um, she would often return home from school to find her apartment burgled and stripped bare. And we aren't just talking electronics or jewelry, everything down to the pots and pans, the food in the refrigerator, even the cutlery would have vanished during the day. Um, so her parents struggled to provide a normal home life. So she encountered some trouble at school too. Her schoolmates teased her for her dark Tartar complexion. And there were a few times she felt isolated, but the resilient mashup found solace in all things beauty from lotion to lipstick to perfume. So her first introduction came from her grandmother who wore the ubiquitous, ubiquitous, Soviet fragrance Red Moscow, which is generously described as pleasantly hefty on the number one perfume review site Fragrantica. Fragrantica? Red Moscow was okay, but Masha wanted to experience different scents. Luckily, she had a cosmopolitan aunt, Sveta, whose beauty and influence allowed her to occasionally travel to the West. To Masha's delight, Sveta would sneak back the most intoxicating perfumes straight from the lavish boutiques of Paris's sixth arrondissement. Uh, Masha was enthralled by the there is a, a bit of a thesaurus issue here. I, I, I'm not a fan of this kind of writing, you guys know that. So essentially she tried some Chanel number no. five, she tried a few things, um, and then she would cover herself in these luxurious fragrances and she would float away from her bleak surroundings. This is very flowery writing, which I'm not a massive fan of. Sense could transform the person she was, the way she felt about herself instantly, elevating her confidence and sense of self-worth. It was at this young age that she understood the power of perfume, which I guess makes sense for Scentbird to exist. Um, so fast forward 15 years, she's now the statuesque Maria Nurisamova. Founder and CEO of the YC-backed startup Scentbird, often described as the Netflix for perfume. So Scentbird is employing technology to make smart recommendations to clients and sell perfume at scale. But that's not all. The company is simultaneously building a beloved beauty brand, which is arguably even harder to do. So here's how it works. You sign up, you complete your interactive quiz. The algorithm then identifies your customer preferences. Do you like citrus or woody, spicy or flowery, aquatic or fruity? Based on the quiz answer, Scentbird will make perfume recommendations and then you select the best options and then you have them in a monthly queue. So then for $14.95 a month, they'll send you a month's supply of the, of each of the perfumes in a cute and convenient purse bottle. For September, you could get Flower by Kenzo, for October, something blue by Oscar de la Renta, and so on. So instead of heading to the nearest department store where attendants spray 50 cents onto a stick until you can't distinguish one from another, you can review scent bird recommendations from the comfort of your couch. You can take a chance on something new because you're spending 15 for a month supply rather than 120 for a whole bottle. Over the past few months, over 600 YouTube influencers promoted scent bird to their 40 million plus subscribers and that was in 2015 so you can imagine in 2024 oh my god 2024 i keep on forgetting that you can imagine how many people are doing it and i don't know if you guys have noticed there's been an uptick in scent but like 
subscriptions recently. So unsurprisingly, Scentbird is slashing through projections growing 40% month over month, and the company is propelled by its adoring users, some of whom are so smitten with the brand that they are painting the Scentbird logos on their fingernails or tricking out the purse bottles with custom gemstone creations. So you might be skeptical about the size of the fragrance market, but it's three times that of the razor industry, which has created companies like Dollar Shave Club and Harry's. Combined, these two companies have raised almost half a billion dollars at valuations, totaling over $1.3 billion. By capturing a sliver of the enormous fragrance market, Sandbird could easily be the next YC behemoth. And they also do cologne on the website, so it's not just like perfumes, it's all colognes, and then also beauty. Now under beauty, they're starting to do like lip treatments and skincare and stuff, but all of it seems to have like around like four or less stars. Some of it has a little bit more, but yeah, so that's that. They're starting to enter the beauty market. She posted on Y Combinator, this is um, recorded live at our female founders conference in New York. Mariana Samova shares the story of building Scentbird. So this is where she basically talks about how she started it, 17 minutes long. But it's basically what was in this article, okay? So we don't need to go through all of that. She also is a bit into spirituality, I guess, in a sense you could say just a little bit so she's written some books and she's planning on writing some more so about the author she wrote 72 keys to manifestation and the rose codes and they're expensive like the hardback is 30 the paperback is 27 and even the kindle edition is 27 and then an audible audiobook is 22 pounds i mean never have i seen these kind of prices and she also has an insight timer page which is for stuff like you can rent you can like get services from people that can teach you like stuff about spirituality and stuff she's got 2,000 followers on here and she will do stuff like eliminate pain and heal a specific organ or part of your body it's 24 minutes guided 4.5 star rating uh replenish your energy and get back to your optimal state mental detox get rid of negative thoughts emotional support to enable more serenity uh, learn what 2023 holds for you guided meditation Heal your energetic body with the white light, the most powerful chakras, alignment, guided meditation, and stuff like that. So you can kind of see where we're going down, you know, what route we're going down, essentially. She also has her This Is Maria website, which is thisismaria.com, where she does all the, like, announcements for live events and private sessions and workshops and retreats and books and everything about just Maria rather than Scentbird. So for live events... She has, you can buy some tickets. Um, she does a writer's workshop. So pen and purpose, unleash your creative vision. Um, it's, it's yeah, just about stuff like that. And it's $333. So that's all she has going on right now. It's a Zoom virtual event. You can also have some private sessions with her. So there are only two spots a month available. So you might want to fill up quick. It's $3,000. It's an energy exchange. So everything on her website is like, it doesn't cost $3,000. It's like an exchange of energies. Anyway, so there's two spots a month available and they're $3,000 each. So if you guys want to book your spot, be there or be square. Um, now she also does workshops. So shop my past workshops, watch past events at your own pace. So you can buy them and then rewatch them. She has the Glastonbury retreat, which is actually out of stock. And it's $1,111. It's $1 I can't believe I was going to say $100. And one to one. <laughs> 1,121. 1,111 dollars, but it's out of stock and it has five five star reviews. We also have the, okay. So the 125 dollar womb healing and restoration. I'm going to talk more about that, why you need to heal your womb. Ancestral healing journey, 112. Throat chakra activation, 77 dollars. Etheric wings activation workshop, healing the witch wound workshop. Yeah, so there's these workshops. Now she also does private retreats, uh, which are interesting in price. So we have the Hero's Journey, a one-to-one -one in person transformational retreat with Maria. This is where people start thinking it's a little bit culty. It's giving a little bit. Ramona did a video on my second channel about Michelle Fon who would attend these kinds of retreats. Now it's interesting because we all assumed she was in a cult, whereas Maria's putting on these retreats. Is she signed a cult herself? Who knows? Do you feel the call for a profound change, a bone deep yearning for a breakthrough, a genuine readiness to step into your highest potential? Are you ready to become the hero of your own story, my dear one? Um, if so, I have something very special for you. It's the hero's journey. Who's this best for? Entrepreneurs, leaders, business owners, influencers, executives, and wealthy individuals asking themselves the question, what's next? Interesting that all these people have a lot of money that could be spent on this. 
Entrepreneurs who are looking for their next level of financial success and abundance or are seeking a major upgrade. Visionaries looking to have a large impact on the world. Successful people who despite having the money don't feel fulfilled and are looking for their true purpose. Anyone looking for answers, clarity or soul aligned guidance. Anyone willing to dive deep and face the hidden and subconscious aspects and anyone who already resonates with my work and my energy and wants more. Now, I'm glad you put this on the website actually. It feels less scammy when you do that. Who is this not a fit for? Anyone with late stage terminal disease looking for a magical pill? Anyone not willing to put in work to achieve their goals? Anyone not willing to give up meat and alcohol for 21 days leading up to the retreat? She is vegan, she believes you get like bad energy from eating animals. And anyone who needs to borrow money to be able to participate in the program. So I actually do enjoy the fact that they're not, like she's not saying, come at any cost, like this will fix your life and if you just borrow some money, your life will get changed. Like she's certainly saying like, only rich people come to this essentially. Which, fair enough. So what's included, you get a three night stay at her house in Southwest Florida, or you can book a villa in Tulum. But she does say, Maria's home is not a five star hotel, but a sanctuary. It's less luxurious and more wholesome. You get organic vegan meals and snacks, multiple healing sessions based on your needs and requests. You get activations through rituals and light language, multiple intuitive readings, personal channeling from your higher self or Maria's higher self Q and A because she has this like higher self where she closes her eyes and then she's entered like a higher self and then you can talk to that like version of her and get different answers about the meaning of life and stuff it's, you know past life regression if desired and guided plant medicine session if desired i think she means ayahuasca with that now the energy exchange aka how much is going to cost is one hundred twenty-five thousand. I acknowledge that this level of investment may not be within reach for a lot of people. That's why I offer so much of my work for free through my social media and my podcast. I also offer books and live events that are much more affordable. But if you have a deep resonance with this offering, please apply below and I'll get back to you with the next steps. And she gives the like breakdown of what you're going to do on those days. It is literally a three day retreat for $125,000. Anyway, anyway, it's almost to do it go right ahead. Now, I did want to look up what is a cult because I think that was like interesting to think about in, in the perspective of this whole video, like what is a cult? So four types of cults and common characteristics. The term cult refers most often to a group of people with usually atypical beliefs living in a relative isolation from the world. They tend to centralize around one charismatic person, the cult leader, who orders the beliefs, behaviors, and customs of all the other members. Many cults stand in as de facto new religions for their followers, but some are irreligious in nature. What does the word cult mean? The word cult descends from the Latin cultus, an ancient word encompassing the concepts of adoration, education, and cultivation. So it was just a catch-all term for groups devoted to a specific subject. I think we're way past that now. So it could be something philosophical, religious, or more mundane and material. So by the 19th century, it evolved to mean an unorthodox group of zealous and eccentric believers. So I guess that makes sense. Characteristics of a cult. Let's get into that. Authoritarian control. Cultism hinges on encouraging maximum dependency. People in a cult must feel incapable of living an individual life outside of the norms of the group. These beliefs often go hand in hand with a worship attitude towards the group's authoritarian leader. Now, so far, I'm not really seeing that, but let's just wait and see. Extremist beliefs, they hold very dogmatic and extreme beliefs. I mean, I guess they also are unable to question these belief systems without fear of reprisal, reprisal, reprisal or punishment from the leader or other group members. So far, I'm not seeing that either. Isolation from society, I guess these retreats and stuff are a way to one-on-one -on -one with you. As soon as new members join a cult, other adherents work hard to isolate them from family members and friends. This helps fulfill the mind control aspirations of the leader. It also creates a hive mind of sort between the new members and other members. The veneration of a single individual. So charismatic leaders are often the center of most cults. Consider the Man Manson family of the late 1960s. As the name suggests, they adopted the beliefs of their leader, Charles Manson, and fulfilled his request. The same pattern repeats in all, most all other cults, albeit to less violent ends in most cases. So, once again, I'm just not seeing that here, but I see how it's like the startings of a cult. This is why I was saying, like, I don't think she's in a cult yet, but I think these are the beginnings. And Willie, she's almost like going to be the leader, not the follower of a cult. Like, if anything, she would be leading this cult, right? Because she's the charismatic, come to my retreat, do this stuff so it's not even like she's in a cult it's almost like she's trying to start a cult kind of allegedly i'm not like making any accusations so we have four types of cults we have the doomsday cult so certain cults come together to prepare for the allegedly imminent end of the world for instance the branch davidians stockpiled firearms and explosives in waco 
Texas compound over the 1980s and 90s to prepare for the apocalypse. This led to an infamous standoff with the federal government. We have political cults, so political groups on both the left and right can morph into cults. Religious cults, spiritual beliefs serve as the bedrock for many of the cults. Some cults are offshoots of mainland religions while others offer brand new dogmas and theology. And we have sex cults, so all types of cults might have a component of sexual abuse but some focus on sex as one of their primary functions. So for instance, New York based, whatever that is, encourage rampant sexual behavior between its group members before dissolving. Examples of cults, we have Heaven's Gate, we have the People's Temple, and we have the Unification Church. Um, and then why do people join cults? Uh, for many reasons, there's a desire for meaning and community. Meaning? I feel like meaning and community here is like, working a little bit. Many have become members of such organizations, have troubled backgrounds and difficulty fitting into society. They also feel mainstream culture has no place for them and nothing of spiritual value to offer either. So former cult members often describe the long lasting sense of loneliness and nihilism. They felt prior to becoming part of something bigger than themselves. This encourages them to put down their defenses and accept the stranger elements of their new communities. Of course, this has sometimes led to horrific and even deadly outcomes in extreme circumstances. So I'm kind of, once again, like I'm kind of seeing like this is not a cult yet necessarily because people are just saying like straight up like she is part of a cult. I don't see that yet, but I'm seeing like I said the beginnings of a cult. So then we have her awakening story. Okay, so it actually happened around a time of stress. She was raising a lot of funds for Scentbird and when she finally was kind of sorting things out, she almost had this big release and she had this dream um, that she talks about um, where she was just seeing random stuff like she was like throwing bubbles at like a like a castle and it was getting gold and then she woke up from that and she just decided that she has like supernatural powers essentially and that she's got like the spiritual awakening she's got this third eye and she also started to believe in twin flames and coincidentally for her um, her husband she was already married to turned out to be her twin flame so how convenient that she didn't have to leave him to find a new guy because he was right there all along um, and so now she uses this third eye to see things and some when i show you guys some of her videos if she has her eyes closed she claims that's when she's kind of using her third eye and she's almost like this other character but when she has her eyes open it's her speaking and this also came out around covid and i feel like that's another trauma like people don't really talk about how covid was trauma for people and i can see how if you don't have if you go through something that, that traumatic i'm not saying it's like a good excuse but i'm just saying if you have gone through something as traumatic as COVID, maybe there is like a level of like, I don't trust the government, I don't trust science, and for some reason. I feel like people can swing either way. People can really lean into trusting the government and science, and then some people lean really far against it. And I feel like that's when some of these things happen, is when you kind of lose trust in like a main organization governing things that we do. Uh, you start to make up your own rules about life. Before this, she actually did a spirituality podcast with her husband, uh, but didn't say that it was her. And so she was posting these kind of like faceless, even reels on Instagram, just clips of, of, of the podcast, but it was just named something else. And then she finally posted a video of herself. And then now that page has like 100,000 followers compared to her private Instagram that has like 2,000. So clearly this is like her more popular venture. I'm also gonna go through some of the reels and stuff in a minute, but she does also believe in like the matrix and NPCs. And she also knows the architect of the matrix. She believes that we're in like a simulation of sorts and that we're putting out energy, that there's no escaping the matrix and that NPCs are basically like players that have no souls and no energy. And they just kind of fill out the crowd. And then like you, who she's talking to, you have energy and you have a soul, but everyone else doesn't. So let's talk about a few of the ones where she talks about like the matrix and stuff because there's some of that on her Instagram. Need that I'm seeing in the collective and the hotter things are getting outside and outside world, the more prevalent this trend becomes of this trend of wanting to run away, this trend of wanting to escape, of not wanting to face life head on. Um, it's it, it's a, uh, essentially a form of escapism and we're seeing it everywhere uh, with people like not wanting to be present to reality. You cannot outrun yourself. You cannot outrun yourself no matter what planet you go on, or even if you don't choose to incarnate inside of the matrix, which is a choice for every soul, by the way. You don't have to come here. You choose to come here. In fact, your soul believes it's a fantastic experience. And so when really, when you're talking about escaping from the matrix, what are you really trying to escape? Because a lot of people refer to if I escape from the matrix, that means I escape from, you know, the control of the bad ones. Uh, all the hierarchy that is above me, whichever shape, way, way, shape, or form it looks. 
But the thing is, how did you become a vibrational match to tyranny? Okay, you guys get it, right. And so the caption is, are you trying to escape the matrix? Um, absolutely, ha ha, it's all a simulation, star seeds, loves. The message don't resonate, but I now understand what a message for a collective means. I was thinking about this these days. Thank you. I've recently had an awakening of the world only being a theatre, us playing the roles as an actor, without realising all of this is programmed. That's not to say that reality does not exist, it's just that it only does to an extent where it won't reach actual truth and meaning of the energies. It's funny how this video has met me as this happened to me. Definitely not a coincidence. But that's essentially what she thinks, that there is a matrix, there's more. It's a construct that contains within itself all 12 dimensions. The matrix is a construct that contains within itself the full realm, the full realm of experience. It has worlds that are completely utopic from our perspective, meaning worlds where everything is love and light. That is not what we are experiencing today. Why is that? It is because the matrix is our great teacher. The matrix is a program that is designed specifically to showcase what are the things that are disharmonious within our being. Okay, so yeah, it's trying to teach us things. The matrix is trying to teach us things. The fact is the right hand of source and the architect and source consciousness, our localized source, which is a projection of the, call it the all-encompassing source consciousness have created the current version of the matrix that we all come to incarnate in. Is this matrix evil? Is it good? The answer is it's neither. It's a game. It's a reality that we all partake in. Every single human incarnated here is in one, in, in some shape or form, partaking of this virtual reality type system. What is the purpose of the matrix? The purpose is learning and expansion. She's also got this weird blue eyed versus brown eyed, brown hair versus blonde hair stuff. Like some of it just seems a little bit weird. I just don't think your hair color determines who you are as a person. Otherwise like whole countries would be a certain way because for example, they all have black hair or majority of them have black hair or something. And it was just like, or like majority of, I don't know, Sweden or Norway have blonde hair. And then, so you're basically just saying that like, this whole country just is what it is because of the hair color or the eye color. I just don't think it, it matters quite as much as she says it does, but there is just a lot of that out there. Then she also discusses her ayahuasca story. It's one of her first videos on her channel and kind of that's that was her awakening. And then she has two parts of her story on her YouTube, just how she started, how she came to be, but it's kind of basically what I told you. There was like a big bit of stress in her life and then she did ayahuasca and now she's that she had this dream and then it all kind of led to her having this like spiritual awakening. This was her first reel on her Instagram. I, I scrolled all the way down. Somebody with the fire energies are what you would expect them to be. You can see her face not in there and it's just like a part of her podcast. Check out podcast for a full episode, Conversations with My Higher Self, but it turns out to be her. She just didn't post her face yet. And then this is the introduction to her showing her face on Instagram. Hi, beautiful people. This is Maria. I decided I will walk and talk with you today. Hi, um, it's FaceTime. Uh, I have had my podcast for about a year and a half now and it has been voice only format. Um, I, life, I love voice only formats, um, but I think it's time for video. So it is a pleasure to virtually meet you if I haven't met you. And it will be my honor to share my story with you. Uh, the human part of it, anyhow. Um, I have had my awakening back in 2018, in the summer, um, out of nowhere. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I was, prior to that point in time, very um, focused on the material. I was building my wealth, still am, by the way. Um, and I, you know, I was interested in all things tarot and... Let me pause up for a minute. She had her awakening in 2018, but then she started posting her face and linking her face to the spirituality. So like publicly being open about this in 2021, which is a year into COVID, which is I think when a lot of people started doing weird things. Like, yeah, like everyone's just doing weird stuff and having weird like conclusions about life and all sorts of things so yeah in 2018 she had like her first awakening and then in 2021 she actually decided to come out with it and talk about it because i think more people were coming out with their weird theories about life and the world and how everyone's against us and it's all conspiracy theories i think she just felt more emboldened to come out with it and i feel like like i said covid and the trauma of that made her go deeper into it because other people were also going deeper into it horoscopes and stuff but i never really i never really thought I could belong into the world of spiritual people. You know, meditation wasn't for me, it wasn't something that I did actively. And so one day back in 2018, I was um, traveling in Portugal with my parents. 
my Clara audience opened up. Um, so it was pretty crazy. Um, I started hearing voices in my head, but not the kinds that you go and see the psychiatrist for. Um, I started hearing the voice of my twin flame actually initially. So that is how it all started. Um, since then it has been a whirlwind of a journey and you know, I've, I've learned a lot. I get downloads every day. I talk to spirit every day. By now I have um, a lot of the Claire's open. So I'm clairvoyant, Claire, um, cognizant, Claire, sentient, all of the Claire's. In other words, um, it's, it's been a crazy ride. It's been a crazy ride. I went from normal to completely not normal in the span of three years. Now, of course, we define normal, right? So who's to tell me what's normal? Um, and I was, you know, up until today in, in the spiritual closet. It's, it's fine. A lot of us are, you know, a lot of us, the awakening souls, a, a lot of us that feel the call of light, spend some time in the closet. That's actually normal. What's not normal is to, you know, awaken the next day, like you tell the whole world. That's not normal. Uh, but I think I've had enough. Um, I'm going through, you know, my own unfolding. I feel like I'm going through my own rebirth at this moment in time channeling phoenix energies and um there could never be a better time to actually start sharing my story i get so many insights you guys my head is about to explode like on a daily my crown center is pretty open and then my poor husband well i guess if you ask him he'll he'll tell you he's the lucky guy but um my poor husband has to be the only one on the receiving end of all of maria's downloads outside of my podcast and so i feel like every time we're having meals or every time you know, I wake up, I'm just like, Sergey, okay, I have to tell you this. Like, I just like had this meditation, and I had this insight. And he goes like, Maria, awesome. Now, he loves all of my <laughs> insights. He does like all of the practices that I download or like, but I also feel like some of my insights are not really relevant to him because he is, you know, he's a clean eater. He is, he's just like, you know, it's just as close as it comes to like being a saint incarnate in the body. So like, I'm not sure how much of Maria's insight this, this guy needs. So she's got her insights and she gets through her downloads, which obviously like, she like downloads insights into her brain and then she says them with her eyes closed, this whole thing. Okay, so that's basically her, her thing. Now, she's got some beliefs that people are talking about and some of them I don't have open right now. I'm just gonna have to add them in post edit because I couldn't find them right now, but I will find them. But what she said was like, most people that have cancer are not aligned spiritually and essentially they're just like not trying hard enough to not have cancer i'll try and find that one 10 million 10 million people die of cancer each year and thanks maria here we can finally figure out why we get cancer it's not like scientists have determined it's from environmental changes or genetics no only maria has the key i'm gonna say something really really controversial a big percentage of cancer on this planet the reason for that the reason that that disease has manifested and has really stuck through with, with humanity is because it is a byproduct of humanity pursuing false ideals. And uh, people that get cancer, again, this is a generalization, but very often they're not aligned with their purpose. Either they know what their purpose is and they're not following it, or they don't know what their purpose is and that's why they're not following it. And you could heal yourself in seven days if you tried from literally anything, whether it's, she gave two examples of cancer and AIDS, you could kill them in seven days if you just thought right about them. If your heart is activated internally, you can heal your whole body. Oh, okay. In a matter of days, you guys. If your heart truly is operating at the level that it is meant to operate for you, you could heal yourself from any disease. I don't care if it's cancer. I don't care if it's AIDS. It could be whatever, but you could heal yourself in the span of under seven days. Wait, it's that easy? In seven days, you can be completely cured. Wow, what a breakthrough, what a discovery. Maria, you've done it again. World peace is on its way. Modern medicine is not real and it's a dead end. Everything else is a dead end scenario. That toothache is not real and it's a show of personal issues. And she does multiple videos, like so many videos about toothache, cavities and wisdom teeth and how it, it's like a sign of, of you lacking like personal stuff and spirituality and stuff getting uh, a cavity or if you and see her eyes are closed so this is when she's getting a download or you know if, if you have a toothache please understand that it goes so much deeper than you know how you take care of your teeth how you take care of your teeth is kind of like at face value like yes you have to brush your teeth obviously i'm not advocating otherwise however if you're just trying to fix your teeth and trying to get less cavities by literally fixing the physicality of how you deal with you know, with your mouth and like maybe buying like a better toothpaste, 
it, you're going to fail. Um, it, in other words, it's really, really hard to make any meaningful changes around your mouth area unless you do some serious, serious cleanup of your lineage and of the dark karma of your lineage, whatever that is. And specifically, right, because your mouth is such a dead giveaway, you should work on the size of your lineages the most where you experience the most obvious issues, right? So I guess the... <sighs> Okay, then we have this one. And when the topic of teeth is being um, discussed, uh, what is discussed and what is believed, right? That there are certain things that impact your teeth quality, if you will. And, and you know, there are certain things that you're supposed to do in order to preserve your teeth, your teeth longevity. For instance, like flossing and, you know, brushing your teeth twice a day and, you know, not eating sugary sweet things, right? All of these things are supposed to, you know, there are things that we know are damaging to our teeth. However, I'll tell you this, if your karma, like the, if the karma of your lineage is heavy, you can do, you can floss all day, every day. You can brush your teeth, like you can be extremely scrupulous when you're brushing your teeth and you're still gonna have root canals, you're still gonna have issues. And then somebody on the other side. So if you have bad teeth and you have a lot of teeth issues and toothache, you're just not trying hard enough to fix your like family trauma. But if you have good teeth, it just means you've never gone through family trauma. Even though there's probably gonna be a lot of people watching my video right now who have great teeth and they've also had family trauma. So riddle me that. And then someone did say that there is actually a demon that takes your teeth. It's the Testament of Solomon. Then we have her opinions about miscarriage. She believes essentially that our bodies choose to miscarry. Before we go into this, I wanna say some of what she says is technically supported by science, but how she says it and how it's actually explained in science is two completely different things, essentially. It's like the same root concept, but completely different idea. For example, she believes it's like your body's way of telling you you shouldn't have a child with this person. I mean, that literally just doesn't, it doesn't make sense, okay? That's just not happening. But what actually happens is a lot of stress or a lot of trauma can cause a miscarriage, obviously. We know that. And it's not the mother's fault for being stressed out and it's not the mother's fault for putting herself in harm's way that causes that. It's just sometimes your body just goes through an extreme, immense amount of stress and that's the result. But it's the way she says things, not what she says. Because, yeah, most often early miscarriage is caused by a problem in the chromosomes that disrupts the number of development. But research has found that some forms of stress may raise the risk of a miscarriage. Short periods of stress that don't disrupt a person's life overall don't seem to raise the risk of miscarriage. So it's obviously just like a like a massive trauma essentially that would happen that could cause this to happen. But here are her opinions. If you have deep concerns around motherhood or the kind of mother that you are, it may cause your body to miscarry. A lot of women have deep set wounding, both from their lineages and their past lives that has to do around pregnancy, delivery of the baby, motherhood, you know, all of it. There's so much trauma. There is probably more trauma around motherhood than there is almost around anything else on planet Earth. And that is saying something. All of this is so wishy-washy. She's basically trying to say that like, because you have a lot of trauma and like a lot of, I guess, um, anxiety around motherhood and like everyone's a little bit nervous about motherhood, wouldn't that just mean that everyone's miscarrying all the time? Because everyone's worried. Like everyone's worried how much of a good parent they're gonna be and how is delivery going to go? Is everything gonna be good? Is the baby gonna be healthy? Like there was so much stress around it. So wouldn't that mean that like every single person ever is just gonna miscarry? But it's just this whole, it just feels very blamey. It doesn't feel rooted in science. It feels like she's just like, yeah, science might confirm some things here, but it's like the base idea is there, it's aligned. And then the way she diverges to a whole different world is. Here one, I invite you to join me for a womb healing and restoration sacred circle. So this is obviously, we saw that on her website she does a womb healing thing and i just feel like even if she's not directly saying that it's to do with like not miscarrying in the future potentially i feel like that's the idea if you keep on making reels about telling women that they're miscarrying because i don't know they're like scared or because they have trauma or there's like issues with the lineage or karma or weird stuff and then you suddenly put out a, a workshop for womb healing i mean put two and two together you're obviously telling people like this i'm gonna heal your womb so you can maybe not miscarry. It's basically what you're saying. I will be hosting on June 8th online. 
we're going to gather together as women and we're going to talk and heal the sacred womb space that we each individually have. As women, our lives are very unique. We have to go through a whole process of giving life and everything that that entails. And with it comes a lot of trauma. As women, we also have to face things like painful periods, fertility issues. As women, it is very important for us how well defined and how healthy our relationship with our own mother is. Because every time we have a wounding around our relationship with our mom, it ends up as a stuck emotion inside of our womb space. I invite you to join me during this event where we're going to go into deep, deep healing work. We're going to go into a meditative healing. Yeah, so not only is it your womb's not healed, womb healing can help with fertility issues, which she kind of hinted at. I'm not saying she fully outright said it, because I don't want to get sued. She hinted at it. Um, she mentioned it there. And that also if you have a bad relationship with your mum, it causes a womb. It, yeah, yeah, besides the point. Let's just go next. I think you are in a loving relationship, so many of you think you're married to the right guy and you may still miscarry for the reason that you're not meant to be with them. It happens all the time. It happens all the time because some people are fundamentally not good for you. Some partners are fundamentally not good for you. So now we a telling women is like the moment they miscarry, they should just think I'm just with the wrong guy. Really? Really? So not only is it your trauma, your lineage, your karma, your, your this, your that, your womb's not healed, you have a bad relationship with your mom, now also it's because you picked the wrong guy, like even if he's like the perfect guy for you. It's so convenient that she, when she learned about twin flames, she found out that her husband actually is her twin flame. Like, do you know what I mean? Everything's so convenient for her. Because it'd be interesting if she had gone through this whole spiritual awakening and had to change everything about her life. But conveniently, she went through a spiritual awakening that allows her to make a bunch of money but she didn't have to change anything. She didn't have to divorce her husband. Like, she had to sell her business. She didn't have to do anything. So that's really interesting how it doesn't affect her at all. There are subconscious fears that you have around being able to provide for a child that are, shall we say, persistent and nagging at you that may cause you to miscarry. Like, if you're worried about the... So essentially, if you have trauma in your root center, in your root chakra around safety, Right? How can I provide? How can, you know, am I going to be enough? Uh, what kind of world am I bringing the child into? All I mean, all of that, like, I think that goes through everyone's mind. This whole victim blaming, like, the moment someone that actually follows her teachings and stuff gets pregnant and starts thinking, am I going to be able to provide? Which is a very, like, valid question. What world am I bringing my child into? Blah, blah, They're going to think, oh my god, I'm going to be scary. And it's just such an obsessive, it's like religion, right? Recently when I talked about Girl Divine, it's the policing of thoughts is what this is. And I hate it. Okay. But she still has the right to say it if she wants. We just are allowed to say that it's not the smartest thing in the world. You can miscarry a child if you don't feel safe. This is a very broad statement. Let, let's start unpacking it. What does it mean you don't feel safe? A, you may not feel safe in your relationship, which again, that's why it is related to that first one. There is something about your current partner that doesn't make you feel safe, whatever that is. Maybe you don't feel safe because you're not sure they're going to stick around. Okay, you guys get it. If you don't feel safe, once again, there is some science in extreme stress slash trauma causing this sometimes to happen. But just having slightly anxious thoughts is not the reason that this is happening. And it does not mean that you suddenly have to divorce your husband who is maybe a great guy to you. Or maybe having some thoughts of like questioning if, if you're going to be a good mother, but that does not cause... Oh, let's just move on, please. My camera battery died. Then there is a clip of her saying that Hitler wasn't necessarily evil because millions of souls benefited from him. And I've heard this theory in the past that like, oh my God, but if it wasn't for Hitler, we wouldn't have all these like medicine developments and stuff. And it's like, is that the correct thing to focus on in this current moment? Like, I think every bad thing can have a 1% benefit to someone but the negative was extremely negative and we could have got the positive without the negative just at a later date or a different timeline like it doesn't mean that without this this would have just never happened i would have never had this no chances are we still would have gotten to it just through a different means and it might have been way less evil so this whole idea is just like not the best but i'm gonna try and find that clip because i couldn't find it right now can it herself be evil not from source perspective it's not 
Hmm. So interesting. So uh... and evil is just a matter of perspective. Like, look at Hitler. He's one of the 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 poster child children for like being an evil person. Do you know how many millions of souls benefited from learning from the experience that he has created? So here you may put, you know, like look at a character like him and be like, oh, he's completely evil. And upstairs, his experience was the greatest, one of the greater, um, you know, sources of knowledge of, you know, of 3D planet Earth warfare. And that is benefiting so many different souls in, in on their evolutionary path. So is he evil? Not really. I don't think so. So interesting. Well, do you want me to give you an, uh, an even better example? Yeah. Do you think playing World of Warcraft is evil because you're killing things? Like in a computer game? Yeah. People don't think it's evil, yes. I know. <laughs> same, same logic. It's a computer game from higher self level. I mean, you go in, you may have murdered a thousand beings on a screen, and then you go in your merry way and nobody's pointing a finger at you at work and being like, this is a mass murderer. But how is that any different? Wow, that's a very different perspective. Uh, yeah, mind blowing. Now, she also says that being overweight is your like barrier from spirituality. And she does say that for children, it is related to trauma. But then for adults, it's like you're trying to block yourself from spirituality, which is interesting. Now, there is some scientific evidence that going through extreme trauma in your childhood may need to do with sexual trauma, which does talk about the child thing. Um, can lead to you having kind of dysfunctional relationships with food and stuff. I don't know how confirmed that's been, but I know there's been some scientific study into that, but that's not for everyone, obviously. I also don't think that it's like you trying to block yourself from spirituality. Like, I just don't think that's the way to go. And she is like heavily pushing vegan and heavily pushing, you know, if you eat meat, you're like blocking good spirituality and stuff. So I think it's like a whole thing. It's like, as an idea. Um, now let me just click on the children one. The same for when children put on weight as opposed to when adults put on weight. It is actually very similar, yes. When kids put on weight, and I'm not talking uh, like, I'm not talking toddlers, okay? Uh, toddlers have to be chubby. <laughs> That's normal. We're talking like, I guess, seven year olds, right? Or something like that. Yes, it is a protective mechanism, 1 billion percent. So if you have a child that has issues around this, look for the trauma okay so now it's like forcing parents to just be like oh my god my child gained a few pounds like I, they must be going through some trauma it's going to lead you down a weird path now like i said there's some scientific evidence that if you go through mainly trauma whether in your child or in your adulthood you might start eating food um, because it might cause a dysfunctional relationship with food there is some evidence for that however if your child is gaining weight at an alarming rate chances are it's not just that they are choosing to eat a lot of food Chances are that you as a parent are providing them with maybe not a great diet or you may be overfeeding them. So it might not even be trauma related. It might just be you as a parent need to figure out some kind of healthy food plan for your kid, right? So because if you're feeding your child McDonald's three times a day, seven days a week, you can't say, oh, it must just be the trauma because it's just not. Like that's just scientifically incorrect. And then obviously there's one for adults. The energies of the planet are rising. If your physical body is dense and heavy, and you are not rising with it, what's going to happen is you are going to feel like you are out of sync with the rest of the planet. What would So basically all the planets are rising, and if you put on an extra few pounds, you'll be too dense, and you won't be rising with the world. Question is, everybody in my lineage, or a few, you know, generations of our lineage, have all been overweight so are you saying that we all have the same issue around like victim mentality and, and like trauma like well, essentially the question is like what are the odds that all of us have been abused as children i love this question thank you so much for asking it there are a lot of chronic conditions shall we say that run in families and it is no coincidence because birds of a feather stick together in order for you to be magnetized into a particular lineage you have to be broken in the same way that the people in the lineage are broken. You have to be healed. Once again, sometimes it could be that, let's say someone's grandparents were overweight and then blah, blah, blah. It could just be a food dynamic. Like the, the grandparents ate in a certain way and then blah, 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 blah. And maybe that's the case for a certain amount of families. Now there are many other explanations that are scientific. 
and amazing and fantastic maybe let's not listen to the fact that like the planets are ascending and you're just too dense like i just i or that like the generations of families go through the same trauma and they're all just overweight because of that there's also um that heart disease in men is linked to their lack of communication and like spirituality an issue for men who develop heart conditions is their inability to communicate actually their feelings so despite the fact that we think that communication dwells in the throat center not in the heart for men specifically the inability to communicate how you feel is gonna give you a heart condition once again there is a lot of amazing research into where heart disease comes from and what the cause is and what you can do to try and mitigate the risk but it can still happen and it has fuck all to do with how well you communicate your feelings really like i know i'm just throwing a bunch of like science says this and, and the things people that believe in this and her they, they don't care that i'm saying science says this because they don't believe science right they're doing pseudoscience for a reason what i'm saying is for everyone else there is science, like there are scientific explanations for everything. And and if there isn't currently like a confirmed explanation, there will be one in like five years time because we're constantly working and medicine is constantly working and science is constantly working. Um, heart disease has nothing to do with how well you explain your feelings. Now I know that for example, anxiety disorder mainly, if you have like chronic anxiety, it can lead to heart stroke, right? Because I think it's like anxiety. I remember when I did psychology day taught us that like anxiety is one of the mental illnesses that kills the highest amount of people. It's because a lot of anxiety keeps your heart rate up, which puts a lot of strain on your heart and it can lead to heart stroke. So you should really try and mitigate stress and anxiety. And that might have something to do with you not communicating your feelings. If you're not able to speak out about what's stressing you out, it might put more stress on you and more anxiety. So once again, in a roundabout way, the base idea is similar. It's just the way science goes one way and she goes a whole other way. It's crazy, right? Because like the root idea is similar, you could say, but it's just the explanation kills me. And I'm not saying that she has like some scientific background, I'm just saying that like, you can almost pinpoint where she grabbed the idea from in science and then just run with it. And then we have a ba basically why you should be vegan. Moving from very dense way of feeding and um, from a very dense vibration, where there's a lot of like predator prey type of emanation, right? Happened and has been going for thousands of years here on planet Earth into completely voluntary exchange, no parasitic nothing, symbiotic relationship between you and the sun, pranic eating from the sun. By the way, it's going to be just as feeling, actually more feeling than your physical food right now. Now, this is very lofty, but I wanted to give that perspective. Look, I was vegetarian and like 80% vegan for a while and I did not feel connected to the sun. So I don't know, you know, I don't know. And our ancestors ate a lot of meat. It's, I don't know, it's been going on like this for a while. Now I'm saying you can be vegan. I just don't think there's any like spirituality in eating vegan food. It is just a diet choice and that's it. But to her, it's like, once again, it's being light to your food, being light to everyone ascending at the same time. It's all about ascension and being light and spiritual. Okay, I think that's it. So now once again, what is a cult, right? Authoritarian control. I don't think she's trying to control anyone, but I think she's definitely putting some strange ideas out there. Extremist beliefs. I, I feel like we're getting there now. Um, isolation from society, not quite, but she is starting to do those retreats. I feel like if she does a lot more of them, I'll start to believe that she's starting her own cult. And then veneration of a single individual. So they're the center of most cults. I don't know. I don't, I don't see there being like a cent, like she is technically expressing her opinions on the internet, but she hasn't really referenced from what I've seen or linked to someone who is leading this cult. And she hasn't really like named it. She hasn't put like a, like a name to it. But it's definitely weird, right? This is why I said like, don't send hate to anyone doing a sent bird sponsorship. They probably don't know. And they probably like, I don't know, they just don't know and she's not, like she is harming, like she is spreading harmful misinformation and beliefs, but she's not like killing anyone. So I don't know, like what do you guys think about this, right? Like I just want to know, is this a cult? Is she starting her own cult? Is it going to be a cult in like a year? Are we going to hear more about this? Because I'm waiting to see what else she comes up with. Uh, but as of right now, is this a cult? Would you think that she's in a cult? Or is she just having really weird ideas? And like, we live in the free world. She's allowed to technically express all her opinions if she wants to, and I'm allowed to express my opinions on her opinions, right? So I'm not like saying that she should be banned off the internet or something, but should she, people be doing scent bird sponsorships? Is she in a cult? These are all valid questions. So now that I've put everything out there for you guys, uh, let me know what you think. Subscribe to the bell icon for engagement, and I'll see you guys in my next one. Bye guys.